AI. Let's talk about animal reproduction. Some of the things in this chapter are going to bring in some of the hormone stuff that we just talked about. We will talk about uh, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, uh, estrogen, testosterone, and where they're produced and what they do. So some of it's going to be familiar. Uh, there's many different kinds of animal reproduction, both uh, sexual and asexual reproduction. Almost all animals have sexual reproduction at least for part of their life cycle. Uh, for vertebrates, it's almost exclusively sexual reproduction for all of them. Uh, and there could be uh, which sex an individual is can change uh, for some species. Some are one sex when they're smaller and younger and change when they get older. Some uh, organisms can produce both eggs and sperm for out their, throughout their entire adult life, like sponges, for example. Uh, so sexual reproduction means that meiosis is going to occur, which if you remember, meiosis means that we reduce the number of chromosomes in half. And then there has to be a fusion of gametes, which for animals is always eggs and sperm. And the definition of that, an, an egg is the larger gamete, sperm is the small motile gamete. If an organism has gametes of the same size, then we don't call them eggs or sperm, they're spores. But we don't have, there aren't any animals that do that. All the animals that have sexual reproduction use uh, eggs that are fertilized by a modal gamete, which we call the sperm. And then that first cell that forms from the fusion of two gametes, we call that a zygote. And that would uh, be a diploid cell. The gametes are haploid. Um, there is asexual reproduction, though, in uh, animals. And we already talked a little bit about asexual reproduction with plants and budding. Uh, and there are animals that do the same thing. So asexual reproduction means that we only have mitosis. Meiosis is not occurring. There isn't, there's only a single parent. And all of the offspring are going to be genetic clones of that parent. So, for, for example, the freshwater Nidarian hydra, which is related to corals, uh, they have sexual reproduction, but they also uh, bud. And so, in that case, all of the individuals that result are going to be genetic clones. There isn't any... Uh, exchange or recombination of genetic information as there is in sexual reproduction. Uh, and there's a little video here of Hydra, but it's not too exciting, so you can watch that on your own. Um, some animals as well, although they don't technically intentionally reproduce asexually, like starfish, if you chop them up into pieces or they get ripped apart by a predator, they can regenerate, and parts that are complete enough can regenerate a whole organism. And we talked about that with, with flatworms as well, that you could take a single flatworm and chop it up into several pieces, and most of the pieces will regenerate an entire individual. Technically, that's asexual reproduction, but uh, that's not really intentional <laughs> reproduction. Uh, so here's a, a, a starfish arm that's regenerating a whole nother, uh, the whole rest of the starfish. Now there are some animals that only have asexual reproduction like most species of Daphnia, which we talked a little bit about them, they're kind of weird. Uh, and they have asexual reproduction by a process that's called parthenogenesis, which uh, means that you have only females in a species that only has parthenogenesis. And there are quite a few species that have this um, invertebrates for the most part. And so this means that there are only females. The female lays eggs. The eggs never go through meiosis, however. Uh, and then the eggs will start to develop from this unfertilized egg. And all of the offspring will also be female. And they will be identical clones of their mother. 
Uh, there are a few cases of parthenogenesis in vertebrates. There's a lizard species in California that's all female and pretty much does the same thing as Daphnia. Meiosis doesn't occur. Um, there's another weird kind of parthenogenesis where meiosis does occur, but then the chromosome number doubles. Uh, and so there is, all the offspring aren't genetically identical. Um, so there's also many hermaphroditic animals, meaning that, so if they are a hermaphrodite, and this is from the two, uh, I think they're Greek gods, Hermes and Aphrodite. So hermaphroditism, meaning that they have both male and female reproductive systems. And now for organisms that do this, generally they, are, they don't self-fertilize. So they will exchange sperm with another individual of their species and have their eggs fertilized by the other individual. Uh, some of them are capable of self-fertilization, but of course from an evolutionary point of view, that is the ultimate form of incest and that is not beneficial <laughs> to the species. So generally that's only as a last resort. Um, and it is, this is one of the challenges of sexual reproduction for sexually reproducing species, is individuals have to find another member of their species to sexually reproduce with. And for rare species, that can be difficult. And there are many weird adaptations for finding members of the opposite sex, including in some species, uh, if there are no members of the opposite sex, but there are same-sex members to change sex so that now they're opposite sex, and some fish can do that. Um, so reproduction doesn't generally happen for animals year-round. It's usually seasonally related. Uh, even for marine species, uh, they often reproduce only once a year based on environmental cues, which trigger hormones. Uh, and we'll talk more about ovulation and spermatogenesis and egg production. Um, and because temperature is a, is a strong cue for reproduction for some species, you know, it's, there's a concern that climate change is going to affect that uh, as well. Um, many species use the moon or other um, nighttime light cues as for reproduction and uh, the increasingly lit night that we have because of human lights being on at night is also a concern for affecting the reproduction of animals. Um, some organisms can reproduce both, reproduce both sexually and asexually uh, but it, it's a rare animal that never reproduces sexually at all. There's very few animals that fall into that category. Almost all animals have some sexual reproduction at least some of the time, even if they have a method of reproducing asexually. Um, parthenogenesis is what we call it when it's an all-female type of reproduction and there are eggs involved but no sperm and no fertilization. That's parthenogenesis. So uh, if so, there are basically two kinds of parthenogenesis. One is that meiosis never occurs. This is what happens in Daphnia. Meiosis never occurs. The eggs are all diploid, and they just start developing, and all the female offspring are clones of the mother. But parthenogenesis sometimes means that Meiosis does occur, and so the eggs are haploid, but then the number of chromosomes doubles, and they're diploid, but both of the homologous chromosomes are all identical. Uh, so the offspring would not be all identical um, in that case. Um, some fish will change sex depending on their size, or sometimes depending on the availability of opposite sex partners. So, for example, the blue head wrasse, which is, uh, this is a male right here. The, uh, these are a popular aquarium, saltwater aquarium fish. Um, the, uh, the smaller ones are females. Um, the male is kind of a large dominant individual in the group. But if he dies, 
the biggest female, which the females look like this, uh, the females will become male. Um, one of the females will become male. And kind of the opposite thing, what happens with clownfish, if you all remember in the film uh, Finding Nemo, um, the Nemo's mom gets eaten at the beginning by, um, what, what eats her? I can't remember, a moray eel, something. And um, so the male is left alone in the anemone. Well, what really happens with clownfish is that if there is a solitary male, the male will become a female and try to attract another male. So in clownfish, the larger fish are the females and the smaller fish are the males. So they all start out as males when they're little. And then as they grow larger, they turn into a female. But they'll also turn into a female if, there aren't, if the female disappears. So in Finding Nemo, what should have happened is the um, dad, I can't think of what the dad fish's name was. Uh, he should have turned into a new mom for Nemo. Uh, so, and there are also some, but this is very common in fish, but there are also some amphibians that can change gender as well if partners of the opposite sex aren't available. Um, let's talk for a second about something that has become uh, an interesting topic in human biology in the last 10 years, and that is the topic of what exactly are intersex individuals and versus transgender individuals, and how are these two conditions different? Because they're they are different. So intersex is a very rare condition in which the phenotypic characteristics, things that we can see or measure in an individual that generally are associated with one gender or the other, if an individual has some characteristics from the male column and some characteristics from the female column. So an intersex individual, that means that for almost everybody in the population, over 99% of humans, you have either all your characteristics are from the male column or all of your characteristics are from the female column. There's a rare percentage, 0.018% of the population, where at least one characteristic is in the other column. And this is the definition of being intersex. So this has nothing to do with perceptions of gender, what's going on in the brain. This is physical things that we can measure. So some of those characteristics would be what chromosomes do you have? Are you XX or XY? We can measure that. Do you have ovaries or testes? We can measure that. Sometimes the testes are undescended and inside of the abdomen, which is where they start out in all males. The testes start out inside the abdomen and then descend uh, during fetal development. Uh, is there a uterus present or other internal sex organs? Uh, what do the external genitalia look like? Do they, does the individual have a vulva or a penis or something that's kind of halfway in between the two, which is what we would call ambiguous genitalia? Uh, what are their hormone levels? Um, do they have hormone levels that are typical of male or female? If they have high testosterone levels, probably due to the fact that they have internal undescended testes. Um, because the, uh, if the testes are undescended, that person will be infertile because sperm will not develop at internal body temperatures. That's why the testes have to descend so that they're cooler, which is necessary for sperm production, but they will produce a normal amount of testosterone even if they're undescended. So what are their hormone levels? Um, sometimes intersex individuals are diagnosed at birth, especially if their external genitalia aren't completely female or completely male, but something in between, then they will be diagnosed at birth, but the rest of them will generally be diagnosed at puberty or slightly later because almost 100% of intersex individuals will be infertile uh, because they won't have the normal ability, they won't make normal sperm, or if that's if they have undescended testes, they won't make normal sperm, or if they have ovaries and a uterus, they will generally be abnormal and they won't be able to carry, uh, get pregnant or carry a baby. So intersex individuals are generally infertile. 
which is the reason why it's so rare in the population because if it's genetic. So there is very strong uh, natural selection against the intersex condition because they, they are not capable of reproducing. So that's natural selection right there. Uh, so transgender is completely different or people who identify as non-binary. Uh, at this time, we don't have anything we can measure for that. Although there's some tantalizing studies showing that transgender individuals, if we look at their brain, if they inject them with radioactive hormones and then look at what ha what's happening in their brain, that their brains tend to look like the gender that they identify as, not what the rest of their body is. So somebody who's transgender is not intersex. They are phenotypically male or female, but they identify either as the opposite gender or as neither gender. Um, and that would be somebody who says that they are non-binary. So right now, this is also very rare, less than 1% of the population. In fact, it's about the same percentage as intersex, so a, a less than a tenth of 1% of the population identify as transgender. I would expect that to increase though in the next 10 to 20 years as it becomes um, more acceptable to uh, state that. And interestingly, if we come up with a brain scan that can confirm that, if it, if it is confirmed that uh, we can tell somebody's the gender of their brain through some kind of a brain scan to tell whether their brain is behaving more like a male brain or a female brain. Um, that might be an interesting physical confirmation for that. But as, at this time, we don't have such a test. Uh, whether somebody is transgender or non-binary is completely self-reported at this time. Intersex, however, is something we absolutely measure. Uh, that is not based on self-reporting of identification. Um, there has been some controversy in sports, in women's sports specifically with intersex individuals. Um, this woman right here, Castor Semenya, she competed in the 2016 Olympics and won the gold medal in the women's 800 meters. She is an intersex individual. And the silver and the bronze medalists in the women's competition were also intersex individuals. This uh, strange occurrence of the fact that a type of, of individual that is so exceedingly rare in the competition in the world, uh, less than a tenth of one percent of the population, that three of them would have taken the gold, silver, and bronze in one event in the Olympics, uh, set off some uh, activity. Uh, so what so Castor Semenya has not revealed to public to the public everything about her condition. We do know that she was diagnosed as intersex at birth uh, by the doctor. Um, it, the, her family decided to raise her as a girl, which is what they typically do uh, with intersex individuals up until recently. Um, I believe she's from South Africa. I think that's where she's from, uh, South Africa. Uh, but she has, uh, and she has stated publicly that that's how she identifies, that her family decided to raise her as a girl, but she feels like that was correct, and she feels like she's a, she is a woman. Um, but she has XY chromosomes. Uh, she has undescended internal testes and not ovaries. She has no uterus and that she has the testosterone levels of a normal male because she has testes. So testes that are in the abdomen won't produce sperm, but they will produce a normal amount of testosterone that is unaffected by being undescended. So that's why her testosterone levels are so high, because she has testes that are producing the testosterone. Uh, we don't know what her external genitalia look like because she has chosen not to reveal that. However, we would suspect that her external genitalia 
uh, are, don't look phenotypically male or female because at birth she was diagnosed as intersex. So that would indicate that something is unusual about her external genitalia, although we don't know what. Um, so the committee that regulates both the Olympics and many other international sports com competitions, including swimming and gymnastics and tennis, uh, the International Association of Athletic Federations Committee decided, uh, they got together in 2018 and said, we, we need to decide this issue once and for all. Um, women's sports is a protected category. Men's sports is not. So men traditionally cannot compete in women's sports. And so the question has always been, who should we consider a woman for the purpose of allowing them to participate in sports? Which is a different question than who should be able to consider themselves a woman for getting a driver's license, using a locker room, uh, you know, whatever other getting married, you know, whatever other privileges a woman might have. So they decided that after talking to many, many experts and looking at the evidence, that what they needed to consider was not testosterone level, but the Y chromosome. That individuals who were born with a Y chromosome have an advantage because intersex individuals who have a Y chromosome tend to have testes, they tend to have high testosterone levels, uh, which is the advantage. Um, so they decided that this rule only applies to XY individuals. So this would be intersex individuals like Castor Semenya and trans women. So trans women who are born phenotypically male and uh, decide that they are actually a woman. If they want to compete in the Olympics as women, that they need to lower their testosterone to compete as women. And I think this was the right decision. This does not apply to XX individuals. So a woman who is XX, who just happens to have higher than normal testosterone levels that are completely natural, totally fine. Uh, but if you are an XY individual, you need to lower your testosterone level with drugs or you have to compete in the men's category. So Castor Semenya has said that she is not willing to take medication to lower her testosterone level, which means that if she wants to compete in the Olympics, she's perfectly welcome to compete in the men's category, but she cannot compete in the women's category. And neither can anyone else who has a Y chromosome. And so this is a very simple test. So they will test everybody's chromosomes, all the women, and anybody who has a Y chromosome needs to have further testing to make sure their testosterone level isn't too high. And they actually have set the limit quite high. So the testosterone that they have, they have to lower their testosterone to a level that's significantly higher than your average XX woman. So it's not a really strict standard for women's sports. So uh, we will see what happens. Hopefully we are going to have the Olympics in 2021. Um, and we will see what happens when this rule is implemented. But women have, uh, XX women, have been complaining about these intersex women competing in track, especially for years and years, um, and saying that it's unfair. So, and if, um, if you're not sure that you uh, understand my point of view, I suggest that you look on YouTube and watch some of Castor Semenya's races. Um, and you can see the physical difference between um, her and some of the other intersex women that compete in track compared to the uh, other women who are competing in track. Um, so I think they made the right decision. Uh, I totally I think it's fine for intersex or trans women to be considered women for everything else. <laughs> but women's sports is a protected category. Uh, and as a former athlete myself, I, uh, this, is, this is something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, you're welcome to disagree with me, however. Um, so uh, sexual reproduction has, uh, is something that evolutionary biologists love to argue about because there's an obvious cost to sexual reproduction. 
Uh, individuals have to risk death sometimes to find mates. Um, a really good genetic combination uh, is not going to be passed on to the next generation because there's always going to be mixing with another parent. So if an individual uh, is superbly adapted to the environment, their exact genetic combination, because there won't be any clones of them in the next generation, their exact genetic combination will not be in the next generation. So that seems like a negative. Uh, and it would seem that to be a huge cost. Yet, we have, almost all animals have sexual reproduction, at least sometimes. So that would imply that there's a huge evolutionary benefit to having offspring that are variable. So when you have sexual reproduction, uh, animals can have a million offspring and every single one of them will be different. So this must be a huge advantage or otherwise sexual reproduction would not be so widespread with the obvious costs that there are to sexual reproduction. Um, there are many examples of losing sexual reproduction and it tends to be in very stable environments. So Daphnia really haven't evolved very much in millions of years and they probably won't because the Daphnia that no longer have sexual reproduction really don't have much of a mechanism for uh, maintaining or increasing genetic variability because every individual uh, has offspring that are genetic clones of themselves. So asexual reproduction is predicted to be advantageous only in very stable environments where individuals who are all genetic clones can be very successful. And we have some plants as examples of this. I think uh, we talked about dandelions being don't have sexual reproduction, even though they produce flowers. Um, their flowers are vestigial, if you want to think of them that way, because the seed, you could cut the top of the flower off, the pollen and the nectar that they produce is completely unnecessary. The seeds uh, don't, there's no meiosis, and the little embryos start to form from the female gametophyte tissue, uh, which is not actually even haploid. So, and we call this process not parthenogenesis in plants, but apomixis. mixes. So uh, all of the dandelions that you see everywhere in the spring are all genetic clones. There's no, um, although they produce seeds, the seeds are, uh, there's no meiosis. And although they produce pollen, the pollen is useless. <laughs> it does not fertilize anything. Um, so for animals, the primitive condition in animals is to have external fertilization. And there are still many groups of animals today, many phyla, or the entire phylum has nothing but external fertilization. So here's some frogs and their eggs. So uh, frogs, most frogs, uh, there are some frogs that do have internal fertilization. So external fertilization means that the eggs and the sperm are shed externally. This is almost always in a wet or even in the water, marine or fresh water, and the eggs are fertilized in the water. Uh, because, of course, sperm needs water or it can't get anywhere. So uh, most of the species that have this kind of external fertilization are either fully aquatic species or marine species, or they return to the water, or they're tropical and they still uh, use a wet environment for fertilization because the sperm has to swim to get to the eggs for fertilization. Uh, some species with external fertilization have uh, um, coordinated spawning that relies on external environmental cues like the coral here, um, which have mass spawnings that uh, depend on the cycle of the moon and they're triggered to release all their eggs and sperm simultaneously into the water uh, to increase the chance that any particular sperm will find the egg because in a, you know, in a coral reef there might be uh, 50 different species of coral. So, 
you, and a sperm can only fertilize an egg of the same species. So to increase the chances that a sperm of one species is going to find an egg of the same species, they spawn at the same time. Um, internal fertilization is, a, a, there are marine and aquatic species that have internal fertilization. There are fish that have internal fertilization, sharks that have internal fertilization, but mostly this is something that happens on land. So land animals, because you can't have external fertilization in a dry environment because the sperm need a wet environment to swim in. So most land animals have internal fertilization. Uh, and that creates complications for the species that have an amniotic egg. That uh, the eggshell has to form after fertilization. Um, and there are all kinds of interesting behaviors that have evolved in land animals for finding mates, uh, and also interesting adaptations for storing sperm as well. Um, birds and insects can store sperm, if the females can store sperm internally sometimes for weeks or even months. Um, so they only need to find a mate one time and then they have sperm to fertilize their eggs whenever, they, whenever they're gonna lay eggs. So, uh, internal fertilization usually means there's going to be fewer eggs uh, because the female is limited to how many eggs she can keep inside of her body cavity, which is generally many fewer. So a female who's releasing the eggs outside the body to develop can lay tens of thousands or hundred thousand eggs uh, in the case of octopus, uh, it can be 800,000 eggs can be released at one time. Um, and for internal fertilization, uh, that's not possible to have that many eggs fertilized internally. So generally, there's fewer offspring and we see more care of the offspring. Like for example, uh, you know, our little crocodile here um, watching babies hatch and uh, Depending on the species of crocodile, some of them care for their offspring for several weeks uh, after they are hatched um, until they are large enough to be less likely to be targets and be eaten by other organisms. Um, for things that have shells like birds and reptiles, internal fertilization has to happen because sperm could never penetrate the shell of the egg. So fertilization occurs when, so that the yolk is the egg cell. That's what is ovulated from the ovary. So for birds and reptiles, they have a yolk, uh, what we would call the yolk when we're eating it. That's actually the egg. That's what comes out of the ovary. For, that's when fertilization occurs, right after ovulation. And then that, uh, that, um, that the, um, the white of the egg is deposited by the oviduct, and then the shell is deposited on top of that. That is after fertilization has occurred. And that occurs right before laying. So the, the longest part of the process is the maturation of the, of the egg in the ovary, and then it is ovulated, and then it, very quickly after that, all the accessory proteins and shell get added. But fertilization has occurred already or not. Um, then there are mammals which retain the embryo and there's also other species um, retaining the embryo and allowing it to develop inside the female has evolved many times in animals. There are sharks that give birth to live babies. There are bony fish that give birth to live babies. If you've ever had pet fish like guppies or swordfish, those have uh, internal fertilization and retention of the embryo and the little baby fish are born directly. Uh, this is a advantage because retaining the embryo inside the female means that those developing embryos aren't going to be eaten by something. So it, she, can, she can't have as many embryos because she's limited by the size of her body cavity. So for example, for a guppy, she can only have maybe 
30 babies at a time, which is far less than some fish, which, which can lay hundreds or even a thousand eggs at a time. But those eggs aren't going to get eaten because they're retained inside the female until they're fully developed little tiny fish. And that's a form of parental care as well. Uh, even some invertebrate animals have parental care. Um, there are quite a few fish that exhibit parental care of their eggs. Even though the eggs are laid externally, uh, they guard the eggs, uh, the fertilized eggs. Octopus guard their, the female octopus guards the fertilized eggs. Um, and then there are a lot of invertebrates that carry around the fertilized eggs. Um, oh, I forgot about uh, the bony fish. Um, uh, the um, there now the name just went right out of right out of my head. Seahorses uh, that the male seahorses actually guard the embryos by taking them into their little pouch uh, and then releasing them when they're mature. So this is a female water bug, giant water bug, and she actually when her eggs are fertilized. She takes them and sticks the little embryos on her back and glues them all over her back so that she can carry them around with her. <laughs> and that's a form of parental care because she's protecting those eggs from getting eaten. She can guard them and keep fish from eating them. If they were just laid in the water somewhere, they would be vulnerable to predation or more vulnerable. And some spiders do this as well, like wolf spiders. Wolf spiders don't have a web. They uh, patrol and they're active mobile predators and they do something similar. They carry their little babies around on their back. Uh, so let's talk about gamete production. So uh, for most animals including mammals and fish and birds, uh, there are gonads that produce the gametes and the gonads uh, produce either eggs or sperm. Uh, some of the more primitive animals don't have gonads like sponges uh, and that the gametes just form from particular undifferentiated, undifferentiated tissue. Nadarians are like this as well. Uh, they have specialized gamete producing cells, but they're not contained in specific gonads. Um, in vertebrates, there's often elaborate tubes and glands uh, to get the gametes to the outside and uh, mollusks as well and annelids. Uh, they have elaborate systems for um, the production of gametes. Um, insects almost all have uh, two sexes and different sets of uh, reproductive organs um, and they're it's very interesting different systems of reproduction have evolved in insects. Um, female insects, many of them have the ability to store sperm for a long time. They have a specialized organ called a spermatheca. Uh, female bees, in fact, can store sperm for uh, like six months or something like that. So uh, the queen bee will mate one time in her life and uh, store all the sperm that she needs to fertilize all of her eggs. So that's an interesting uh, evolutionary strategy uh, in insects. Um, most vertebrates only have a single opening called a cloaca. So if there's one opening for the digestive system, so that means fecal matter, for the excretory system, so that means whatever the kidneys are producing, whether it's uric acid or urea, and the reproductive systems, if there's just a single opening, that opening is called a cloaca. So reptiles, birds, amphibians, fish have a cloaca, a single opening. Um, for uh, mammals, however, mammals usually have separate openings for the digestive tract and the reproductive tract. Uh, except for uh, the egg-laying mammals, the monotremes, they also have a single opening, a cloaca. Um, ovaries are the female gonads, and ovaries uh, have oviducts to take the eggs to the outside. 
If the embryo is going to be retained internally, then there is a uterus. So the frogs that we looked at, then dissected, frogs don't have a uterus, but they do have oviducts because they have external fertilization. Uh, the uterus is for retaining the embryo internally for development, and a uterus has evolved multiple times in different types of um, vertebrates. So uh, the ov so here's the ovary, and the ovary is loose in the abdominal cavity. Uh, it is not connected or surrounded by the oviduct. So when the egg is ovulated, it is attracted and kind of drawn in to the fallopian tube by the action of cilia in the fallopian tube, creating a current of fluid flowing into the fallopian tube. But, I mean, this is just the open abdominal cavity here. And occasionally, the uh, fertilized egg does not make it into the fallopian tube and ends up outside somewhere. Um, which would be an ectopic pregnancy. It's also an ectopic pregnancy if it gets stuck in the fallopian tube. Um, so the developing egg, uh, the developing egg is uh, developing inside of a follicle. Uh, a follicle is cells surrounding that egg cell that are feeding it, nourishing it, uh, because the egg is going to get very large. Um, it's going to be one of it's going to be the largest cell in the human body by the time it's ovulated. It's going to be about a hundred microns in diameter, which uh, it's getting that large because of all the follicle cells around it. The follicle cells are also producing hormones, uh, including estrogen is being produced by the follicle cells. So we call this developing egg an oocyte. And we pronounce both O's. It's not oocyte. Don't say oocyte. It's oocyte, like zoology. Both O, it's Latin. So uh, Latin doesn't have any two-letter sounds, uh, for vowels anyway. So we pronounce both O's. So uh, the egg travels down the oviduct, which is called fallopian tubes in humans and they move along by the action of cilia. Here are cilia inside the fallopian tube uh, that wafts its way to the uterus. Uh, fertilization will have occurred, if it's going to occur, well before the egg makes it to the uterus. So sperm swim all the way to the ovary, <laughs> and fertilization can occur as soon as the uh, egg is ovulated. If there are sperm there, fertilization can occur. Um, the uterine lining where implantation is going to occur is called the endometrium, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, the end of the uterus is the cervix, and that is what is going to open during delivery. Um, mammary glands aren't technically part of the reproductive system, but for mammals, this is how the uh, babies are going to be fed after delivery. Uh, the mammary glands are full of many small sacs that produce milk. They can store milk for hours, uh, and they have smooth muscles that squeeze the milk out in response to suckling action by the baby. And from an evolutionary point of view, uh, the mammary glands evolved from sweat glands. So that's why in the primitive mammals, the monotremes, there's actually no uh, nipple. There's only like little glands that secrete milk that are just dispersed on the skin. Uh, so that was the primitive, the more primitive condition. So interesting evolutionary development there. Uh, so let's talk, talk a little bit about gametogenesis. So sperm uh, formation is called spermatogenesis. And gametogenesis just generally means production of gametes. Spermatogenesis means production of sperm. Spermatogenesis is continuous after puberty. There is no male version of menopause, although sperm production uh, it can slack off a little bit in old age in, uh, among 
all mammals. Uh, sperm production is continuous. Hundreds of millions of sperm are produced in a day, um, but each individual sperm takes about seven weeks to, from when it starts meiosis until it's ready to go. So, uh, and we did look at this in one lab in 1151. You might remember looking at the rat testes slides. So within the testes, there are seminiferous tubules, and that's where the sperm are produced. And this is just a little slice of one of those seminiferous tubules. So along the outer edge, that's where we have the stem cells. So remember, stem cells are cells that are going to con that can continually divide by mitosis. They are not specialized cells, but the cells that they produce can become specialized cells. And that's what these spermatogonium are. So the spermatogonium along the outside edge, they are the diploid stem cells. And they divide by mitosis. And once they are going to start to, uh, the, once one of the daughter cells is going to develop into a mature sperm, now we call it a primary spermatocyte, and it starts to move inwards towards the lumen. Um, it's diploid, so primary spermatocytes have started meiosis, but they haven't completed the first meiotic division yet. Once they complete that first meiotic division, now they're called a secondary spermatocyte, and they're haploid now, but they have only completed the first meiotic division. Because if you remember from meiosis, the first division is the one where the chromosome number uh, is cut in half, and the second division is when uh, the sister chromatids separate. So uh, then the second division happens, and now we call them spermatids. The second division is complete. They're still haploid. And then they are going to cast off almost all of their cytoplasm. And the size difference is actually much greater than they make it look like in this cartoony image. The mature sperm are extremely tiny compared to the size of one of these spermatogonium that they started at. So they're going to cast off almost all of their cytoplasm during this maturation process. Um, and this just summarizes what's happening with the chromosome. So the stem cell is diploid. It's going to divide by mitosis. Uh, some of those daughter cells are going to decide to become mature sperm. They will enter meiosis. Uh, and then they are a primary spermatocyte. After the first meiotic division, they're a secondary spermatocyte. And then when they complete meiosis, they are spermatids. Uh, and finally, they are mature sperm cell. Um, and they are really, sperm are really a, a, a chromosome delivery system. They have virtually zero cytoplasm, a very condensed nucleus. So uh, they only have, for humans, there's only 23 chromosomes uh, and a single chromatid for each one. So uh, only about one quarter of the amount of DNA in a typical human cell. They are, and it's extremely compact because there's no gene expression happening. It's very condensed, very, very tiny. There are mitochondria to produce ATP for um, the flagellum, but uh, these aren't going to enter the egg. So when fertilization occurs, that uh, acrosomal reaction uh, will cause this to burst open here, and only the nucleus is going to enter the egg. The rest of the sperm is lost, and so the mitochondria don't generally um, enter the egg, although, you know, in biology there's exceptions to everything. And we have found, uh, scientists have found a few rare exceptions to that. They found one family where it appears that some of the mitochondria from the males does uh, end up in the zygotes. Um, and in chickens, too, somebody found that certain breeds of chickens, some of the mitochondria end up in the next generation from the rooster. So there's always an exception in biology. Um, this is a little video of flagellar movement that I'll let you watch on your own. So uh, egg development is called oogenesis. And it takes much longer than sperm development. And 
it's not, and very, very few eggs are going to be produced compared to the number of sperm that are going to be produced. So this is a little slice of an ovary here, similar to what we saw in lab um, in 1151. And we can, you can see the little immature oogonia uh, here on the edge, on the outside edge of the, of the ovary. As they start to mature, they move inward. So here's uh, primary oocytes here. And then as they start to divide, uh, they have this large fluid-filled follicle that develops. And this will eventually get larger and larger and then be ovulated. And not just the egg is ovulated, or the oocyte, I should call it, because it's not really officially an egg until it's completed meiosis. And once it's when it's ovulated, it, meiosis isn't going to be over yet. Uh, but this process is a longer process. Okay, so, and again, it's oocyte, not oocyte. Don't say oocyte. Um, so we have our primordial germ cells and our oogonium. Now remember, the spermatogonium are stem cells. The oogonium as well can divide by mitosis, but that stops very early in fetal development. So for humans, the oogonia stop being stem cells and stop dividing uh, by mitosis around seven months of fetal development. So for all the women, you're, you have the number of uh, oocytes that you're going to have when you were a seven-month fetus. Uh, it was thought that that was absolute and that there was no division of oogonia after that point for mammals, but there's been some studies showing that, that there might be a little bit of mitosis of the oogonia continuing after birth and maybe after puberty. You know, it's you know, it's like everything in biology. You make a general rule. Oh, well, well there's this thing over here. Um, so again, the primary oocyte uh, is diploid. It has started the first meiotic division, but they get stuck in prophase of meiosis one. So when, for humans, at birth, there are about 70,000 oocytes in the two ovaries of your average human female, uh, about 35,000 in each ovary that are stuck in prophase one of meiosis, and they're just gonna sit there <laughs> until puberty and when they will start to develop one at a time. Uh, so when under the influence of hormones, when the individual primary oocyte starts to grow and starts to mature, it will complete that first meiotic division and start the second meiotic division. And it gets stuck in meiosis two in metaphase. So here's metaphase. So now it's haploid. We've got a polar body here because there's it's we're not going to get all four products of meiosis, aren't going to do anything. Uh, so we get our first polar body. The follicle is maturing. That oocyte is going to be ovulated as a secondary oocyte. It will not complete ovulation until fertilization. So the um, fertilization is going to trigger the completion of that second meiotic division. The follicle which has been producing hormones all along at the, as it's growing, this maturing follicle, that's one of the functions of the follicular cells is producing hormones. It's going to continue to do that, and it becomes uh, the structure known as the corpus luteum, which uh, lutea means yellow, so in Latin, so and corpus is body. So corpus luteum literally means yellow body, because it looks yellow under the microscope, and that's because it's producing steroid hormones, so it's producing lots of cholesterol, and so it looks yellow under the microscope. So that's the corpus luteum. It's going to produce um, progesterone is the most important thing that it produces, and it will start to degenerate after a few weeks if there's no embryo. Uh, so spermatogenesis and oogenesis differ in three important ways, the first three things here. So in sperm production, all four products of meiosis will produce a sperm. 
But in egg production, only one egg results from meiosis. The other three products of meiosis are these little tiny polar bodies, which are essentially garbage bags for the excess DNA, so that we can end up with a haploid cell to be fertilized by the sperm. Uh, spermatogenesis occurs continuously while uh, oocyte production, the production of new oocytes stops during fetal development, mostly we think, uh, and then those eggs that are present at birth are going to mature one at a time over the course of the female's lifetime. Uh, oogenesis has interruptions, so things like Pregnancy and breastfeeding will temporarily stop the maturation of any new oocytes. Uh, nothing really will inter interrupt the production of sperm. Um, and another interesting thing is that the primordial germ cells, so the primordial germ cells are the cells that are going to ultimately produ produce the oogonia and spermatogonia. Um, the primordial germ cells are set aside in the early embryo. Um, very few cell divisions, especially in the female line uh, in vertebrates, the female cells divide way fewer times than the male and they are not generated from the general population of mitotically active cells in the embryo. They are special cells, they are big cells that obviously have more cytoplasm and are larger than their surrounding cells. So these are primordial germ cells in an early embryo, an early mammalian embryo. Uh, and this is selected for by natural selection because every time a cell divides, there can be DNA errors. In fact, some DNA errors occur every single time a cell divides. So the fewer cell divisions there are every generation, the fewer errors there are going to be. So this has been selected for by natural selection to have in the female line for producing uh, the oocytes as few cell divisions as possible each generation. So after fertilization, if it's a female zygote, there will be very few cell divisions to produce her batch of uh, oocytes and then on and on for each generation. So interesting selection by natural selection. Okay, so in the next uh, video we will talk about details of the menstrual cycle and the hormonal control of reproduction and a little bit about the stages of pregnancy and how pregnancy occurs.